when John uh, published his video on um, decreasing his coronary calcium score, I expected to get some criticism as his doc. Uh, I didn't tell him that beforehand. In fact, I encouraged him to um, to do the video. Here's why. Um, here's why I encouraged him. Obviously, to get the kind of impact to sh it's newsworthy to decrease a coronary calcium score. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, very unusual. I've seen it maybe twice <clears throat> in my career. Um, and it was very much associated with the changes he, he made in his lifestyle. 42 pound weight loss, um, uh, decreasing uh, recorded blood sugars as high as 300 down to keeping them routinely below uh, 100. So again, people say you don't, you don't get a decrease in coronary calcium. Well, he did, and I've seen it. And um, again, it was associated with what he uh, accomplished from his lifestyle. But back to my first comment, why did I expect to get criticized as his doc? A couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, uh, serium, uh, serial calcium scans. Uh, I don't know anybody that recommends serial calcium scans, although you can do them. And you saw in John's case, uh, there was a significant, uh, significant correlation. Uh, usually you don't see a correlation, and that is a stepwise uh, increase in uh, calcium as you get a stepwise increase in, um, um, in plaque. But that wasn't the reason, well, that was one of the reasons I expected to get criticized and didn't. Um, here was another reason, maybe a bigger one, and that is <clears throat> also the reason why uh, a lot of people don't reckon recommend coronary calcium screening on a, uh, again, screening basis, and that has to do with safety. There's a perception out there that there is uh, significant risk associated uh, with radiation from coronary calcium scores. It's a CT technology, and um, there is significant um, radiation. <coughs> but we're going to cover, cover a little bit more detail on it and make the point um, that it's not even in the same ballpark. Uh, why am I showing um, a picture of the Cincinnati Reds Stadium, uh, Garmy Stadium, again? When we're talking about risk of coronary calcium um, radiation uh, compared to risk of um, heart attack and stroke if you have uh, coronary calcium or if you have plaque and you don't know it, um, no comparison, they're not in the same ballpark. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure there are uh, quite a few out there who are saying, well, Brewer, wait a minute. You said there is some risk and it's significant. I want to know more. Okay, we'll tell you a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> this article came from um, the Journal of MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's the Ramapril cough in there. Um, the, the title is uh, self-explanatory. <coughs> Imaging strategies to reduce the risk of radiation in CT studies, including su selective substitution. And it mentions MRI in the title, but I'm not going to get that deep in this article. I will give those of you who have an interest, <coughs> as usual, I'll uh, give you the reference um, below the uh, video in the, uh, some of the text explanation. Um, but they also mention multiple times in this article, substitution with ultrasound. And that is exactly what CIMT uh, technology is. Um, I will step away from the risk question for just a second and compare the screening technologies. The most common screening technology you'll see out there with uh, standardized medicine is um, stress tests. Um, and I, I, I run away. I get anaphylactic. I get an, an allergic reaction to talking about ordering uh, stress tests. I have ordered a few. Again, uh, three or four, not that many. Uh, stress test has way too many false negatives. 
Uh, you remember Tim Russert? He's the one that, he was the news guy that had a, a normal stress test in March of, uh, when was it? 08. Um, and then had a fatal MI in um, June. So unfortunately, stress, negative stress tests give way too many people a false sense of security. So from that perspective, I uh, personally feel that they're dangerous. Uh, you get far fewer uh, false uh, negatives with coronary uh, artery calcium score, but again, with coronary artery calcium score, you've got this radiation issue, and uh, you've got a major issue with, with um, um, they don't correlate so well uh, with increase in plaque, you know, the serial type of, um, of uh, correlation. You can't judge on an ongoing basis. So <clears throat> I've done a few of those. I do those in cases like with John where you had, um, uh, you had very confusing CIMT picture and in John's case it was due to the increasing sensitivity of the CIMT creating a false impression that there was an increase in plaque when we both doubted that severely. And Todd, again Todd Eldridge came on and gave us some good guidance in that area and uh, agreed very strongly that there was not an in increase in plaque. So <clears throat> that's the digression. And again, uh, those of you who are interested in this question of just how much uh, radiation, how much uh, risk is associated with CT um, technology. Well, <clears throat> this article comes right out of the blocks, uh, giving you some good numbers. <laughs> the FDA estimate for a CT uh, dose of 10 millisieverts, let's not get try to quantify that, but let's go to the next part. Associated with an increased chance of developing fatal cancer for approximately one in 2,000 patients over a lifetime. <clears throat> lifetime risk needs to be uh, quantified and compared here as well. When you're talking about lifetime risk in terms of... Um, radiation, we're talking about infants, five-year-olds, uh, all ages. And the lifetime for an infant, the expected lifetime for an infant and five and 10-year-old, 20-year-old is obviously much greater than the expected lifetime of a um, someone with heart attack and stroke risk. In fact, we'll talk about Cafe's Caves uh, study um, a little bit later and compare the risk and life expectancy for folks with um, with plaque. And we'll see, we don't measure risk in terms of lifetime there, we measure it over a 10 year period. And we're also, again, I'll, I'll um, uh, bottom line it here for those of you who just want to hear it and move on to the next video. We're talking about risk of like a 4 in 10, 8 in 10. That's untreated. If you don't, if you have plaque and uh, significant plaque, Plaque up to the area, uh, to the level of um, obstructing flow is an 8 in 10 probability of having a heart attack or stroke over a 10 year period. Again, I'm, um, I'm going to the bottom line and, and giving, a, um, giving away the information uh, for later, a spoiler. <clears throat> Again, pardon the digression, I'll get back to uh, helping understand the the risk and putting risk associated with uh, CT in perspective. Again, we were talking about uh, fatal cancer in one in 2000 lifetime. We're not talking about immediate and we're not talking about over a 10 year period either, as I just clarified. Uh, cancer risk in and of itself, one in a thousand lifetime risk. So again, these uh, ra CT radiation is not um, Not in totally innocuous, not in totally safe, not totally safe, like CIMT and ultrasound uh, technology is. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who'd like to get a little bit deeper uh, comparison, they start out uh, in terms of um, comparison comparisons with um, atomic bomb survivors, uh, atomic bomb testing. Uh, 
folks that were in the same area, I think it was Solomon Islands, whatever islands it was, there was a, a large um, health cohort where they studied these folks. I mean, these folks had skin burns, they had um, um, cataracts, they had immediate surface, body surface uh, problems. Um, <clears throat> you don't see that these days, and that's not really associated with uh, CT scanning. Now, as many of you may know, that has been associated with radiation therapy. Um, so again, when you start getting into radiation therapy, you're getting back into a whole new area of risk. Um, we're not talking about those levels of risk with CT. We're talking about, again, uh, one in a thousand, one in two thousand lifetime increased uh, risk of cancer. Uh, I'm going to jump over to another uh, comparison point, and that has to do with chest x-ray. People get very concerned about uh, chest x-rays and say, well, you know, I don't want to have a chest x-ray. I, I don't recommend, I don't use chest x-rays very often either. Gosh, maybe 10 or 20. I, one of my major uh, associations with chest x-rays was that as an epidemiologist, uh, public health prevention guy, one of my major jobs was getting rid of the, the old habit of routine screening chest x-rays. So how does chest x-ray compare to CT? Um, about 100 to 1,000 chest x-rays is equivalent to the radiation in one CT. So again, CT is not innocuous. It's not a, a totally risk-free um, technology. I, I, I say all of that and I think uh, the, people are hearing this and they're never going to get a, a CT. I would ask you, please watch the, uh, the, um, the movie Widowmaker. It's very good. It's actually encouraging the use of uh, coronary calcium. Um, I would say, look, if uh, it's going to take a, a coronary calcium score to get you focused on your heart attack and stroke risk. You're better off doing a car coronary calcium score. As I've shown uh, multiple times, and we'll continue to talk about during uh, discussions of science in a mini-series on um, screening programs for uh, heart attack and stroke risk, you'll see that I clearly recommend CIMT. I had a, um, a great uh, discussion with Todd Eldridge, who's an epidemiologist that got very passionate about CIMT screening for um, heart attack and stroke. Uh, that's in another one of our videos. We go into depth on the problems and frustrations associated with getting CIMT out there. Um, <clears throat> this uh, study is the CAFE's CAVE study, and again, it helps us begin to put or continue to put risk in perspective. This is a, an old video, I mean an old image from um, Brad Bale and Amy Dunneen. They, um, they taught me a lot of uh, the focus that we're talking about with CIMT and some of the other technologies that, uh, uh, that we're looking at. And they have a great uh, training program for uh, docs, dentists. I know a lot of uh, non-medical people, nutritionists, uh, a lot of uh, other folks who have gone to their courses. Very, very good course. And um, a very good book they've written, uh, Beat the Heart Attack Gene. Now, <clears throat> this is the CAFE's CAVE study, as you see in the title up here. This was like maybe the definitive study in helping us understand the value of CIMT. This was using CIMT, carotid femoral ultrasound, <laughs> screening and cardiovascular events in low-risk subjects. Now here we've got this term, this word risk again. In this title, what did risk mean? Did it mean they'd had a coronary calcium score and it was low? No, that, that, it did not mean that. Um, did it mean that they'd already seen low risk on uh, ultrasound CIMT screening? No, this, they, had, they had low risk as defined by Framingham. Framingham is all um, demographic and history type stuff. Are you a smoker? What is your age? What is your uh, gender? Um, what is your BMI? 
Um, again, BMI hopefully will be replaced by relative fat mass soon, but again, at, at that time we were looking at BMI. They took people, 10,000 adults, they actually had 13,000 subjects, but 10,000 adult subjects went a full 10-year period. They did uh, CIMT screening on these folks. And all 10,000 people were people like me five, 10 years ago, who you would say, you're an adult, you've, had, um, you've got some association with being a male and age, but really no, um, no other significant risk factors. Well, <clears throat> they did find significant uh, risk using CIMT screening. Now, let me give you some of the numbers. At 10 years, there were 10 events for um, people with class one. That was none, uh, that was, um, again, a, a, a fairly low number. That was the folks that they would agree. Yes, they're low risk. 81 events in class two for 930 subjects. But here's where you got folks like me. I had a plaque. Um, if you look at arterial age, 72 years old, even though I was 57, and everybody would have said, you're a low risk individual. I would have fit in the CAFE's cave study. I would have gotten led into it. I would have been in this class three um, there were 611 subjects out of the 10,000, um, and there were 30, 239 events in 10 years. In other words, um, about 40% of these individuals had a heart attack or stroke within a 10-year period. Um, so you begin to see there are those of us who are out there who would have been labeled very low risk and said, you know, I don't have a problem. They also, out of that low-risk uh, pool, they found there were, uh, what, uh, 470 subjects who had um, plaque to the extent that it um, obstructed blood flow. If you had that much plaque, even though by Framingham you had very low risk, you had an 81% probability of having a heart attack or stroke over the next 10 years. So again, this uh, CAFE's CAVE study is a critical, it's a landmark study, and it makes it very, very clear. We've got an, a very safe technology with CIMT. I'm not saying it doesn't have problems. It does. But it's a safe technology which is extremely effective at taking... Uh, people that thought they had low risk and uh, finding a significant population. What was it? Uh, uh, what, up to 40% of them had risk that they just did not know about. So again, we talked a lot about risk. We talked a lot about screening um, technologies for heart attack and stroke. I, if you've made it this far in the video, I appreciate your interest.